All right, and we'll get started in about two minutes. Then we welcome everyone who's logging in right now. We will be soliciting your questions using the Q&A form at the bottom of your screen. Please do check us out in there, ask your questions there, and let us know where you're looking in from. Hello to Christine in Saskatchewan. And to Doug in St. Mary's. And we've got Ruth Jenkins looking in from the Midlands in the UK. Welcome Ruth across the pond. Cheryl in Newmarket, Franz in Ajax, Krista in Penetang Machine. Dwayne is in Oakville, which is in my hometown, and Sandy's out in British Columbia. So we're getting a good number of participants coming on just as we're coming to the top of the hour. We had a great response. We had over 300 RSVPs. So thank you all for taking some time out of your afternoon today. And I'm looking forward to learning a lot about genealogy and ancestry.ca. Krista will give us a bit of a background on her introduction to it. I'm a relatively new user of Ancestry, exploring my own family's roots in Scotland and Ireland, looking forward to learning how to access the military records of my grandfather in World War II and seeing how much further back in our family tree I can, I can reach out. So I'm looking forward to, to learning more about that and I hope you are too. And, and we'll be taking your questions as well using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen once we get going. And if you're just signing in now, please do take a moment to share your question in the Q&A box in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen and let us know where you're looking in from. Krista will be joining us any moment. We've already had our audio and video check and we'll get started momentarily. And there's Krista now. I see you're still uh, on mute, Krista, but we'll get your microphone turned on. And yep, we I'm will, well, wonderful. Well, welcome to Krista. And I'll just start by saying welcome to everyone who's tuning in this morning or this afternoon from across Canada, and uh, I see some places around the world as well. My name is Anthony Quinn. I am the Chief Community Officer here in the National Office of CARP, and I'm very pleased to have Krista Cowan with us today. She is the Barefoot Genealogist, and she will be walking us through everything you need to know about Ancestry.ca, CARP's newest partner, and all of your perhaps initial questions and maybe follow-up questions on genealogy how it works and how people can access their own history using the Ancestry portal. So thank you very much for joining us today, Krista. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. So, uh, so the, my, my role here today is to play a bit of the, oh, my pleasure, I'm just having a little delay there. Uh, my role today will be mostly to, to run the technical side of the meeting and to relay the members' questions as they are coming in to you. I don't want you to have to look through the Q&A section, but I know you have a presentation to give. And as the, the expert genealogist uh, for, with Ancestry.ca, let us know uh, what we don't know about uh, this uh, exciting field and, and how our members can get started with Ancestry. And I will open the floor to you and invite anyone who has a question as we're going through to type it into the Q&A box in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. So Krista, over to you. Fantastic, thank you so much. And welcome everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, I am the corporate genealogist here at Ancestry, but you may hear the name, the barefoot genealogist thrown around a little bit. I've been with Ancestry for uh, almost 19 years now. And in that time, um, over the course of the last 11 years, I've been really heavily involved in genealogy education. And part of that means that I do a lot of social media. So I create YouTube videos and I'm on Instagram and I do Facebook Live. As a matter of fact, I think uh, in about three hours or three hours from now, I'll be over on the uh, ancestry.ca Facebook page doing a little live Q&A there for that audience. 
Um, and so I got the nickname the Barefoot Genealogist because that is the name of my YouTube series. Uh, there's about 400 videos out there available to help walk people screen by screen through how to use ancestry and ancestry DNA and how to make family history discoveries. So that's a little bit about me and my background. Um, I've kind of been peeking into the Q&A while we were getting ready and set up and you were all coming in. So I see that you are from all over Canada and I am thrilled um, to, to be here with you today. I'm actually leaving tomorrow morning to go on vacation up to the San Juan Islands in Washington state and hope to um, get up to that part of Canada during my vacation this coming week. So um, I, I'm thrilled to, to be here with you today. Now let's talk a little bit about who cares, <laughs> right? That's always the question um, that people are like, why would anybody want to do genealogy? Why is it interesting? Um, and I'm going to share two stories with you to just kind of help start to get you thinking about it. Some of you probably have a lot of interest, um, maybe have for a long time. As a matter of fact, in surveys that Ancestry does, one of the things that consistently is reported back through those surveys is that about 76% of people have some interest in family history. That interest, of course, is varying degrees and it changes over time. Um, one of the things that we have also discovered is that we have these what we call life moments of truth. Whenever um, a parent passes or a new baby is born or somebody in the family gets married, whenever there's those transition moments in life, our thoughts and our interest tends to turn a little bit more to family. And we start to have questions. Um, you know, when you're trying to come up with a name for your new baby, sometimes you wanna troll through the tree. Um, when your parent passes and you realize, oh, I didn't ask them all the questions I should have asked. What do I still need to know? Or maybe you inherit a box of old photos or a family artifact and you don't fully know the story behind it. Those are the kinds of things that often turn people to family history. Uh, and so whatever your level of interest, I hope that at least in our time together today, you'll get a little glimpse of just how simple it is to start to collect some of that information in those memories, not just for yourself, but also to pass on as a legacy to the next generation. So let me just share with you uh, my first story. I had the opportunity about five or six years ago to attend a gift lounge for a, an award show in Hollywood. Uh, every time there's the Grammys or the Emmys or the Golden Globes, they, um, in the two days before the award show, usually will take over several floors of a hotel and then um, companies can come and set up in the suites in the hotel and the celebrities involved in the award show then come through those hotel suites and learn more about the product and get their picture taken. And of course the hope for the brand is that the celebrity will use the product and talk about it. And so it's a, it's a form of marketing. Well, Ancestry was at the, um, the HBO Emmys Lounge in, uh, in Hollywood a few years ago. We had a full suite to ourselves. We had the computers set up around the edges of the room, about four of them, and myself and some of my colleagues were there. Uh, we were giving away little swag bags with, with DNA kits in them. And so as the celebrities came through, they'd get their little swag bag. And then if they wanted to stay and build a family tree, we would walk them through that. And there's always this chance that like, A, people aren't going to want to share personal private family information, particularly that um, uh, genre of people. And the other challenge, of course, is that, you know, it's one thing to walk through a few gift lounges and get some swag. It's another thing to sit and spend 20 minutes with somebody talking about something personal. So I'm always surprised. Uh, we haven't done a ton of these events, but the few that we've done how eager people are to sit with us and to have these conversations. So at one point, uh, the cast of the HBO show Ballers, uh, it's a TV show about football, uh, football players uh, and their agents, uh, they all came in, several of them, and one of these big, burly, tall, black football player actors <laughs> uh, came over to me. And I, he said, well, what, what are y'all doing here? And I said, well, we're helping build family trees. Is that something of interest to you? And he said, well, sure. Okay. So we sat down. And so I'm standing there and I'm driving, I'm typing and moving the mouse while he's just telling me. And I said, okay, tell me your name and your birth date and place. 
because that's how you start family history with yourself. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, tell me your dad's name and his information and tell me your mom's name and her information. So that's, we're just kind of doing the same thing everybody does when they get started. You start with yourself and what you know. And then I said, okay, now tell me about your grandpa, your dad's dad, move back one generation each time. So he tells me about grandpa. And I said, okay, tell me about your grandma. And he paused and he kind of looked, cocked his head and he looked at me and he said, well, now here's the thing I've learned. <laughs> There's always a story in the pause. The pause means something um, significant. It means something is different. It means there's a story there somewhere. And so I've learned to navigate that pause. And I said, what's tripping you up? And he said, well, my dad is the youngest of 10 children and his mom died in childbirth with him. And then my grandpa remarried really quickly because he had nine children and a newborn. And so I have the grandma that's my dad's birth mom, biological mom, and then I have the grandma who's the mom that raised my dad and that I know is my grandma. And I said, fantastic, we can put them both in the tree, right? People have, families are messy. Families have always been messy, that's nothing new. And history is messy. And so sometimes we have to accommodate for those things. And so I said, tell me, tell me the name of the grandma you knew. So he told me that information. And then I said, okay, tell me the name of the grandma you didn't know. <laughs> and he paused again. And he said, you know, I don't even know her name. And I said, okay, well, is there anyone in your family who might know that information? Now, step one of building a family tree is you start with yourself and you put in what you know. Step two of building a family tree is talk to your family, <laughs> see who knows what. And he said, oh yeah, hold on a second. Grabs his phone, shoots off a text, gets a response immediately, picks up the phone and calls his dad. And he's like, hey pops, I'm sitting here with some people from Ancestry. Now, you have to picture this space. We're in a, a hotel suite. We've got a computer up against a wall. We've got a dozen or more other people in the room, some at computers, some not. I'm kind of scrunched up against this wall with this computer keyboard in front of me at a stand-up table. He's sitting on a stool next to me in all of his massiveness. <laughs> and so I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> so I am not moving as he's having this very personal conversation with his father. Um, and I can hear both sides of the conversation pretty much. <laughs> and there was no way for me to escape. So I said, so he's like, yeah, Pops, I'm here with some people from Ancestry and I'm trying to learn more about our family history. So I'm building a family tree and I need to know your mom's name. And I hear his dad say some words and then he says, no, the mom who gave birth to you. Oh, okay, yeah. And so he repeats her name and I type it in. And then I point to the birth date field and he says, do you know when she was born? And then his face kind of falls and he says, oh, okay. Well, do you know, and I kind of pointed at a few other things on the screen and he said, do you know anything else about her? Did you know her maiden name? He didn't know a maiden name, he just knew a first name. Uh, do you know, and I pointed to the death date field and he said, she died the day you were born, right? Yeah, okay, so I type in the death date. Okay, Pop, okay, thanks. Okay, I'll talk to you later, bye. Hangs up the phone. So I click save on this profile we've just created for biological grandma. And no sooner do I click save than up pops a little leaf hint. Now on Ancestry, we have 30 billion records from 80 countries around the world. And as soon as you enter something into a family tree, our hint engines go to work trying to match information in your tree to information we have in some of those records. And sometimes we find something right away and sometimes it takes a little bit of time or a little bit more information. But in this case, we immediately got a leaf hint, that leaf hint when we clicked on it led to a death certificate. So she had died in North Carolina, um, here in the United States. Uh, every state determines the privacy laws of when birth, marriage and death records can be made public. Same thing in Canada, um, every state and province determines that for itself when those records can be made public. And in this case, death records in the state of North Carolina are public records. And so Ancestry has put them on our website. So up pops her death certificate. 
It lists her name, her first name and her married name. It lists her date of death. It lists the cause of death as complications due to childbirth. It lists the name of her husband. And then it lists the name of both of her parents. So now we have her father's name, which is her maiden name and his birthplace and her mother's name, including her maiden name and her birthplace. And I got choked up, he gasped, he got choked up. We save this record to the tree. The process of saving that record to his grandmother in the tree adds her parents, adds her birth date, which was also on the record and her birthplace, which was on the record. And so now we've added information to the tree by attaching this record. Now we've added her parents to the tree and he goes, is there more? Can we find more? Yes, absolutely. So we click on the new leaf hint that pops up on her parents. And it turns out that it was a US federal census. Now here in the United States, we take a federal census every 10 years since 1790. We do it on the tens. In Canada, y'all do it on the ones, right? So just a little bit different. Here in the US, we have a 72 year privacy law on census records. In Canada, you have a 90 year privacy law on census records. In England, they have a 100 year privacy law on census records. So as soon as those records become publicly available, Ancestry acquires them, we put them online, we index them to make them searchable. And so he had gotten this, this hint on a census record. It was his grandma as a child in the household of her parents and it listed her parents and their ages. So now we had their approximate birth years their birthplaces that matched the death certificate. Then it listed all of her siblings. There were about six of them. And this kid starts bouncing, this kid, this 30 year old kid starts bouncing up and down in on his stool. And he's like, oh my gosh, wait a second. That's my, that's my grandma, yes. Those are her parents, yes. These are her brothers and sisters, yes. He starts putting the pieces together. And he says, those are my dad's aunts and uncles, yes. He said, I don't think my dad even knows he has aunts and uncles. Are any of them still alive? Oh my gosh. So we save the record to the tree. Saving the record to the tree again walks us through this process of attaching it to the parents who are already in the tree, attaching it to grandma who's already in the tree, and then adding all of those siblings into the tree so that now we have this family group that has been recovered and reclaimed into this family story. And we did a quick search through some of the um, children, some of those siblings in that family, and we found that one of them was still alive. And I gave him the information he needed to see if he could find her. Um, we did some Google searches and some other things to try to track her down and gave him that information. He hugged me, there were tears, it was beautiful. He um, left, like went through the rest of the gifting lounges at the event. Ancestry was the first stop at this event. And then uh, it takes about an hour and a half or so to work through the event. Usually you work your way through and then you leave the building. An hour and a half later, he comes back and he waits for me to finish who I'm talking to. And then he comes over to me and he says, I have two things that I need to say to you. Okay. <laughs> he says, first of all, how is it that I am 30 years old and today is the first day I have ever heard the name of my grandmother. How does that happen? And I just explained, I said, you know, families are messy. Uh, your grandfather had just lost his wife. He had a newborn, he had a bunch of other children. Uh, we don't know, you know, I don't know what he was doing for a living. Did he have work? Did he not have work? Um, you know, he, life is hard sometimes. And sometimes people just, push it down and move on. And they don't talk about things. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And so sometimes when you step into family history, you're also stepping into hard things. Sometimes you're looking at military records for a, for a parent or a grandparent who fought in a war that they never spoke about. Sometimes you're finding a marriage record from a first marriage that you didn't even know your dad had. And you're making a discovery about a time in his life that he never, never informed you of. Sometimes you take a DNA test and you find that your 
you know, aunt had a baby that she placed for adoption that she never told anybody about. So we're wading into these waters of very complicated, sometimes very messy things. And the beautiful thing about family history is that it helps us start to heal some of those things. Whether those people are still alive or not, uh, that information can be brought out into the sunlight and, and it can, when it sees the light of day, um, have an opportunity to heal some things. And he got, he, he just kind of hugged me again. And then he said, you know, he said, I need to tell you the second thing. He said, when you asked me, what's your grandma's name? He said, I didn't even hesitate. I'm gonna, of course my dad knows. He said, I, you know, texted my dad, picked up the phone and called him because he was available. What you don't know, he said, is that my dad and I haven't spoken in six months. We had a fight six months ago. We had a huge falling out. We have not spoken, but I didn't even hesitate to call him when you asked me that question. And he said, the last thing my dad said to me before I hung up was, son, will you call me back when you're done and let me know what you found out? And then he said, I'm so excited. He said, I don't even think I'm gonna make it home. I'm gonna go out to my car right now in the parking lot and I'm gonna call my dad because I wanna tell him that I found his mom and I found his grandparents and that he has an aunt that's still alive. And I wanna share that with him. I'm so excited to share that with him. And so when people ask me, why do you do family history? That's why. It's not just about connecting us to our ancestors, though there is power in that. It is also about connecting us to each other. And I told this story in a video that I published a few years ago. And remember this kid's an actor, right? Like that was my only interaction with him, though meaningful, fleeting, and I don't expect him to remember me. But I thought I'm gonna find him on Instagram and I'm gonna send him a, just a private a private message and you know who knows he probably gets a ton of them uh he may not even see it but i'm going to include a link to this video so i just did i said hey you probably don't remember me we met a couple years ago at this event but i just told your story completely anonymized just like i shared it with all of you um i, I and i just thought you might be interested to hear it he responded to me 22 minutes later and i know it was 22 minutes later because that's how long the video was <laughs> So he clearly clicked the link, went out and watched the video. And he came back uh, and he just said, I need to share something with you uh, that's the rest of the story and you might be interested in this. And he sent me a photo and it was a picture of him and his dad courtside at a Lakers game. And he said, this was last week. And he said, after that weekend, after that experience, he said, I've looked more into my family history. My dad's contacted his aunt. We've learned more about my grandma. And my dad and I have been talking again and trying to repair our relationship. And for me, that was the payoff. That was the payoff for why I do what I do in genealogy education. I don't need to know the, the end of the story always. I love that he shared it with me, but I know that that's the end of the story or a part of the journey that a lot of people are experiencing as they engage in family history. So for me, that is why family history. Okay, um, and, and if that's all you hear, I hope it's enough to get you talking to your family. Of course, we're going to spend the rest of our time together now actually diving into how to build that family tree. I'll walk you through some screenshots of using the site so that you know where you can start to collect this information, but, um, but that for me is the why. Um, do we have any questions so far that have come up? We've got some specific questions related to individual searches so i think we can hold off on those okay. until we get a little further down the line but uh, hearing that story it it is so uh, inspiring but not everyone's going to have krista at their at their disposal yep. when they get when they get engaged and sit down in front of their own computer so i'm looking forward to hearing that that, that how, how one gets started and where we go from here for sure absolutely okay well let me go ahead and share my screen so that we can dive into this getting started piece here uh, with the website. Let me turn this into presentation mode. And there we go. Okay. So um, that was our agenda. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of ways to access ancestry.ca. So depending on your level of comfort with technology, let me just explain that to you. The first one is we do have a mobile app. So if you spend the majority of your time on a phone or a tablet, or if that's your only access to the internet, um, you can download that. It's available for iOS devices. So 
um, iPhones, iPads. It's also available for Android devices. Uh, so, um, you know, Kindles and tablets and, and Google Play, Google phones. I'm not, I don't, I'm not an Android user. I don't, I don't know exactly what those devices are, but you can access it through the App Store on iOS devices and through Google Play on Android devices. And I would encourage you to download it, even if you do have a computer. Um, I use the mobile app as a companion experience to my desktop web browser access. Now you can access Ancestry directly through a web browser on your mo mobile devices. It does work best with Google Chrome, but you can also use it um, you know, with other, um, other web browsers, Firefox, uh, et cetera. And so, Krista, Krista, sorry. And if yeah. someone if someone joins uh, on their home computer, they can download the app and log in using the same password, and, and they can interface either way. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me of that. So yes, when you first go to, to ancestry.ca, um, you sign up and you have some options. Um, your options are that you can just have a free registered guest account. So family tree building on Ancestry is a free service. So you'll just create a login using your email address, have a free guest account so that you can get started building a family tree. And then you would use, yes, that same login, no matter which web browser or device you're using so that it's always accessing the same account on Ancestry um, and you're working off your same family tree. So thank you for that. Um, so, so you can go to ancestry.ca on a web browser or go to the mobile app. Now, like I mentioned in the, in the story I shared, you're always gonna start with what you know, and then you're gonna talk to family members. When you get to the website, um, it's, you're probably gonna have something on your screen that, that says build a tree or start a tree or create a tree, right? We're always testing that. So it, it sometimes changes the exact language of it, but that's what you're looking for on the website. And then when you click to do that, it's going to ask you to start with yourself. So you're going to add your own personal information, uh, your name, your birth date and place. Of course, you'll notice there's no field for death date and place because you're adding yourself. <laughs> so if you're adding yourself, we hope you're still, still kicking. <laughs> um, then you're going to add your parents. So click on your father or your mother. It doesn't matter which one you start with. And you're going to add their information. Now, this is where we need to have just a brief conversation about privacy. So Ancestry is asking you to share really personal information, names and dates and places of individuals in your life. And um, one of the pillars of how we do business is privacy and security. It is so important to us because we're asking you to share that information. So whenever you enter someone into your family tree, you will be asked whether this person is living or deceased. If this person is living, you want to make sure that you mark them as living because that triggers the ancestry privacy protocols. So what happens is you'll enter, so I'll enter, for example, here, my dad into my family tree. I mark that he is living and I will be able to see all of his information because it's my tree. I'll be able to see his name and his birthday, anything I enter, any photos I upload, I'll be able to see it. But if any one of you was to come look at my tree, all you would see is the word private. You wouldn't see his name. You wouldn't see any dates or places. You wouldn't see any photos or documents I, would up, I had uploaded. All you would see is the word private. So you'll know there's a person there. You'll know I have entered my father into the tree, but you won't know anything about him. Um, and that's really important, again, because we want to protect the privacy of living people, but we recognize that that's part of the process of building out a family tree. So are there any questions that come up as I talk about privacy and security? Uh, I'll just ask a couple of questions related to that, Krista. And so if I've marked my grand grandfather as deceased, so I haven't checked the living box, mm -hmm. could my long lost cousins uh, in South Africa, for example, where I know they actually live, could they see his data then uh, and, and perhaps include him in their trees as they're building them? Yes, so great question. So um, at a person level, 
we control privacy by that living or deceased toggle. At a tree level, we give you full control over who you want to see your tree or not. So there's three tree settings on uh, Ancestry. One is public. And all that public means is that anyone with an Ancestry subscription can see the dead people in your tree. So yes, those cousins, if they had a, a, an Ancestry subscription, they would be able to see your deceased grandfather in your tree. The second setting for a tree level is private searchable. So what that means is your cousins might do a search on Ancestry for grandpa. Your tree would pop up and it, it would say, we think we found somebody that matches this information in this tree. But as soon as they clicked to try to view it, it would say, well, this tree is private. You need to ask that person permission to see that tree. So it's searchable. They know something exists in this tree that matches what they searched, but they won't be able to see it without your permission. And then the third privacy setting at a tree level on Ancestry is uh, private unsearchable. And that means nobody on Ancestry will even know a tree exists on your account. It won't show up anywhere. It won't be indexed by Ancestry. Um, it, it's a, it's a valid option. Uh, everybody, we want everybody to have control over that, but you do need to know that with private and searchable, then there are some functions that don't work, right? Some of the connection functions, some of the DNA functionality, because it requires some visibility. Now, at any of those three levels of privacy, at any time, you can share your tree with whomever you want to, whether they have a subscription or not. So if, for example, if your brother said, hey, I heard you were building a tree on Ancestry, you can say, oh yeah, let me share that with you. You can go into your tree settings, you can share your tree. He does not have to have a subscription. He will need to, to create a login, one of those free logins, so that he can access the website, but he won't have to pay any money to the, to the site as a subscription service. You then can decide, do I wanna give him guest access, meaning he can just see it, do I wanna give him contributor access, meaning I want him to upload uh, that box of photos that he scanned from grandma, <laughs> or do you want to give him editor access, meaning we're gonna work on this together and he's gonna help me build out the family tree. Um, so, so privacy has to do with person level, tree level, and then you can share it individually with anybody you choose. That's great. That, that answered a question that just came in from Janet. She was asking about uh, getting her ancestry info onto her daughter's and granddaughter's tree. So that's just a matter of allowing them to share yeah. and access. Yeah, they don't have to create their own tree. Right. They can just all work off of that same tree if they so choose. Terrific. Well, there's there's a questions are coming in fast and furious, and I Good. will I will encourage everyone to write your questions down in the Q and A box uh, in the toolbar. At, it's at the bottom of my screen, and depending on what device you're using, you will find it in the toolbar uh, using the Q and A. And one of the uh, maybe the initial questions about Ancestry: How does it work with Ancestry.ca and Ancestry.com? Do they work together? And someone asked about the Church of Latter Day Saints: Are they the proprietors of Ancestry? Okay, great question. So um, let me actually answer the second question first. <laughs> so um, Ancestry was started here in Utah uh, because of the fact that uh, the LDS Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they own Family Search. So if you're familiar with the FamilySearch.org website, um, they own that website. Uh, the LDS Church has been involved in genealogical research and in collecting historical records from around the world since the 1890s. And because their headquarters are here in Salt Lake City, um, they have built the largest genealogical library in the world, um, the Family History Library up in Salt Lake. So because of their presence, a lot of genealogy companies have kind of um, sprung up here in this same area. Um, so no, Ancestry is not owned um, by the LDS Church and never has been. It is a privately held company. It was um, a startup by two new college graduates. Uh, back in the 1980s, we started as a book publishing and, and 
uh, company, genealogy book publishing company. Then we went to publishing data on CD-ROMs. Um, as a researcher, that's when I became an Ancestry customer. Was um, I think my parents purchased for me uh, an entire copy on CD-ROM of the 1880 census for my 20 something birthday. <laughs> Um, and then in 1996, when uh, the internet uh, became a, a public and, and more viable thing, they took those CD-ROMs, put them online and launched Ancestry.com. So um, to answer the second question, uh, Ancestry.com was the initial website and uh, that has been since grown. So we now have um, websites in, I think, nine countries. So Ancestry.ca, of course, Ancestry.co.uk in uh, England, .com.au, .it in Italy, .de in Germany, uh, .mx in Mexico. So all these websites, okay? Um, and, and really what the website uh, URL is, is just an overlay on all of the data that Ancestry has. So all of the, the 33,000 databases of containing those 30 billion records, all of the DNA testing that happens, all of that is, is you know, the databases underneath. And then we just put a portal on top. Right. So you're accessing the same data, regardless of where in the world you're coming from. Now, the reason we have localized websites in different countries is, um, you can see here on my screen, I am on ancestry.ca, if you look at the URL here, and over here on the um, top right, you're gonna see that this allows us to toggle between English and French. So there is an English and French toggle at ancestry.ca. If I come to ancestry.com, um, what you'll notice is that the website has this overlay, has a few different things, but here in the US, the toggle is not between English and French, it's between English and Spanish, because here in the US we have a large percentage of Spanish speakers. At the ancestry.de website, everything is in German, right? So it's just the portal that sits on top of the uh, website itself, but all of the data that you're accessing is identical. So, so I know my family roots are in the UK, mainly Scotland. There would be no uh -huh. reason for me to log into ancestry.co.uk. I can find nope. the same information hundred.ca. Absolutely, Perfect. you got it. Okay. Thank, thank that, you and that answered questions. that answered a couple of questions. So I think we can go into Fantastic. your next. Okay, let's keep going. So as you're building out your family tree, um, there are just some really basic genealogical standards that you might want to get in the habit of following. Um, all genealogical software programs are all written to these standards, which means it's going to make sure that you're getting the most out of um, the automated tools and processes that you're going to use on the website. So the first thing has to do with names. When you enter names into your family tree, um, you don't wanna enter anything into the name fields except names. Um, I often sometimes see people try to like put fancy little codes in their tree or you know, try to you know, make sense of things and they shove a bunch of stuff into the name field. Um, sometimes um, a lot of us have immigrant ancestors and those ancestors may have changed their name uh, for one reason or another. Um, they may have anglicized their name. They may have picked an entirely different name. Uh, so Ancestry also provides alternate name fields. So you can enter as many names for a person as you need to, and then you just pick which one you want to show up in the header. But, it, but, but uh, just keep that name field really clean. The second thing, the second important point is around women and their maiden names. So you always wanna enter people into the family tree by that birth name, because that's gonna give you the most success of finding the records. Um, so for women, it's gonna be their maiden name. Uh, recognizing fully that some women never change their surname even when they get married. And then some women have been married four or five or six times and they've changed their name every time. So every time you add a spouse to that person, Ancestry will take into consideration the fact that at some point she may have used a different surname and we will search for those things um, in the hinting and searching processes. So that's just some really basic, a basic standard around names. Uh, Krista, if I, if I could jump in now, yeah, there's please. a question from Ginny and she's asking about ancestors in Europe or countries that have had to change their names because of mm -hmm. politics or being taken yep. over through war. And, and is that the idea you, you use the name you know and then you'll find tips further and as you're, as you're digging in? 
Yeah, so let's just take a look here at, <clears throat> this was a terrible choice, but it'll illustrate the point. <laughs> um, this is an ancestor in my family tree who immigrated from Scotland actually to Canada and then eventually uh, down into the United States. And so he has this name. I can come in here and I can add um, an alternate name fact. So I can just come down here I can add another name for him. And then I can add that name, you know, maybe he went by something else. Like if, you know, if I've got Jewish ancestry, he may have gone um, by a Hebrew name. Uh, I may have an ancestor who has a Russian name or a Lithuanian name in addition to the Hebrew name, in addition to the name that he used when he finally immigrated to Canada. So I can add as many of those name facts as I need to in my tree. Then um, there is a suffix field. And some of you may notice um, as, I, as you start seeing my tree pop up here in our time together, I use that suffix field as a little bit of a catch-all. So sometimes I might put an actual suffix like junior or the third into that suffix field, but it's also a place where I put things like in this case, an emoji of a ship because he's an immigrant ancestor. So it's a way to kind of um, code or uh, tag my tree with some of that information that I wanna see visually when I'm viewing my tree. And you wouldn't put that in the name field, as you mentioned, because that Correct. would mu muddle it, but in the yep. suffix, it's a good place to do that. Yes, so the suffix field is not gonna affect any of the hinting or searching. Great. Okay, so that's names. Let's talk next about uh, places. So uh, places are really complicated. <laughs> uh, and if you know anything about history uh, or the history of even just of your country or of your province, you know that over time, uh, as you go further back in time, those boundaries have shifted and changed. Um, there's different countries that have claimed ownership of certain lands at different times. And um, sometimes the entire names of cities, for example, change when uh, a new boundary is made or when a new country takes over. So, so we have to kind of keep that in mind Ancestry is trying to help with that. So one of the things that we have here is we have a team of people who is constantly working on what we call our location dictionary. So we have um, this historical location dictionary. We're constantly trying to match up places, you know, spots on a map with what it has been called over time. Um, and that includes the full name of the place, city, province, country, right? Here in the US, it's city, county, state, country. Um, in England, it's, you know, town or village or parish, um, right? And sometimes those jurisdictions change and then the county and sometimes those county boundaries have changed and then the country. And so we try to help you by giving you a type ahead whenever you start to type something into any location field on Ancestry. Um, but the two pieces of advice that I would give you the, the, that will help you the most is always include the name of the country because I know this is true here in the US and in Canada, there are a lot of towns named after places in England. <laughs> and so we wanna make sure that we include the name of the country so that it's clear to us and to the algorithms doing some of our searching and hinting for us what country we're talking about. And don't abbreviate those countries um, if at all possible. Um, the example that um, we often use is SA. A lot of people will put SA in their tree. And for some people that means South Africa and for some people it means Southern Australia. So you have to be kind of clear about some of those um, ambiguous uh, names of places. And that's just gonna give you the cleanest experience on the site. Questions? For, for countries uh, that have changed names in our own lifetimes, yeah. something like Croatia and Yugoslavia, yep. and that was once part of Austria, that, yep. that type of, you would use the current country name, but, and then the algorithm will search for that point on the map rather than the country name, whatever it was uh, 200 years ago. You got it. And that, I got that? Okay. Yeah, that's kind of a personal choice. And there's actually two schools of thought in, in the genealogy community. Um, some people will only put the name of the location as it was at the time the event happened. So if grandpa was born in this place and it was called this, I'm going to put that what it was called when he was born there. Interesting though, sometimes then you end up with grandpa's profile and if he never moved and he was born, married and died all in the same spot of land, but the boundaries changed around him, it ends up looking like he was born, married or died in three places. And so I personally am in the other camp. I prefer to put the current location in the location field. And then just in my notes, I 
put this story about this place, right? Place becomes a character in the story of your family history about how those boundaries changed and why they changed. Was there a war? Was there, you know, what happened? And kind of include that as part of the story. A question about accents on names and different Cyrillic letters and other alphabets. Yep. Uh, how important are those? So, so yeah, so Ancestry does accommodate that if you are using the website in a foreign language. So if you're using it um, in a non-English language, if you're using it in French or Spanish or German, um, those diacritical marks on names and places can be entered, um, especially because most people who are using the site in a language um, other than English have a keyboard that accommodates that fairly easily. Uh, but if you're using it in English, of course, you'll have to, you can enter them. It'll just require, you know, that little extra uh, keystrokes to get the right characters in there. But Ancestry does recognize those. So diacritics, um, uh, Ancestry recognizes. Ancestry is not currently optimized for, for other languages. So you can, you know, if your family is, um, you know, Chinese, or if your family is Jewish and you want to enter characters in um, Hebrew, or if your family is from Eastern Europe and you want to enter characters in Cyrillic, you can enter that, do that data entry in your tree, um, but you won't always get the hints and search results. It just means you'll have to take a couple extra steps to find the records in those languages. Okay, and another question from Terry, and Terry seems to have, have been involved in some uh, Gene genealogical research in the past. She said she has a saved uh, tree in a GED format. Would she be mm -hmm. able to import that into Ancestry or does she have to start again? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So if you've ever created a family tree anywhere in old software, I started back in the 1980s with a DOS-based software program, right? So if you've ever created software, a genealogy or a family tree anywhere in any kind of software or online program, the export file from that is what's called a GEDCOM file. The file extension is .ged. And yes, you can import those into Ancestry. So if you just come in here and you go to create and manage trees, and when you get to your tree creation, you can upload a GEDCOM file. So that is an option. If you happen to be um, on Family Search, if you have a Family Search account and a Family Search login, um, while Ancestry is not owned by uh, them or affiliated with them, um, we do have some integration with some of their website uh, features. They have an open API, so you can import your tree uh, from Family Search if you have a, a tree built over there as well. Or you can just start that, create a new tree process, and and build it out yourself. Terrific. A reminder just to someone who was asking, we are recording this and we will share it with everyone who is registered who may have missed uh, logging on or if we're going too fast, you can watch it again and, and watch it at your leisure. And we're going to, we're scheduled to go till half past four, but uh, I, I'm not sure how much time will take, but if someone said they had to leave by 4.15, they can watch the end of the, of the presentation on the recording. So back to you, Krista. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we talked about names. We talked about places. The last genealogical standard is around dates. Dates get really tricky. And so there is a genealogical standard. Uh, we enter dates by the day of the month, then the month, either spelled out or abbreviated, and then the full four-digit year. And we do that because in different places in the world, they write dates differently. Um, for example, um, I'm, I don't even know how y'all write dates in Canada, but I know in the UK, they write them reverse of how we do in the US. So if, if somebody was born on 12-11, here in the US, that would be December 11th, but in England, that would be November 12th. Yeah, we're, we're stuck in the middle. So half of us do it one way, half of us do it the other. See? Confusing, so yes. confusing. <laughs> um, and then the reason the genealogical standard was, was set uh, as this type on the left is actually because um, spelling out the month and then adding the comma and I mean, just all of that, apparently back in the early days of genealogical software, DOS-based software programs, they were trying to use as few characters as possible and still be clear. So this was then set as the standard. And then the, you know, the day and the month, making sure you've got those, and then the full four-digit year, we enter that because very quickly, as you do family history research, you're going to end up in a different century. And so we always want to make it clear whether we're talking about the 2000s or the 1900s or the 1800s. So we add those. So uh, as we're building out our family tree, 
um, we are going to then, like I said, start to get some hints. So let's just take a look at uh, my family tree. I've actually um, got it built out quite a bit, but there are some um, kind of interesting things that we can share here. Um, there are two ways to view your family tree. So we have what's called family view, and then we have pedigree view. So family view, you'll notice I'm down here at the bottom. Here's my parents. Um, these are my four grandparents up here. And then these are all my dad's siblings and their spouses and my mom's siblings and their spouses. Down here, you're gonna see my siblings and their spouses. And then there's little arrows so we can expand the tree out in any number of directions. Then we can also toggle that to what's called a pedigree view. So a pedigree view is just gonna show you and your ancestors. Ancestors, of course, are anybody who has the word parent in relation to you. So my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. So this is the people you inherited DNA from, okay? It's great. I use the, the, the pedigree view probably most often because it is the quick and easy way to kind of use it as a map to navigate around my family tree. Some people like the family view. Um, for me, it, um, I have a little bit of AG, actually I have a lot of ADHD and so it gets a little bit overwhelming. And so I like the simpler view, but some people have brains that can connect all the dots very easily. And so they can navigate through this complex view very simply. Um, so for example, I could expand out here to my grandfather's siblings, trying to do this without a mouse. And so I'm trying to click and drag, <laughs> it's not working. Um, or you can go into any person in your tree and you can also then see the view of their immediate family members. So here on my grandfather's page, we have his parents. I can expand to see his two siblings. I can then scroll down to see his wife and his children. Um, and this is what we call the person page. So you have a pedigree view and a family view. So you can navigate and manipulate and add information from either of those views, or you can just come to a person and you can add uh, information from this view. So it's just a really, a um, lot of different options for different people. We also have uh, introduced or reintroduced something that we um, removed for a while from the site. And then a lot of users asked us to bring it back, which is a family group sheet view. Um, and that actually just takes the same data and now it gives you uh, an extra couple of um, people on the screen. So again, here's my grandfather. We've got this box around him because that's who we're viewing. There's my grandmother. Up above here, we have both sets of their parents. And then down below, we have all four of their children. And I can click on any of those people then to navigate to a view that makes them the focus person. And, and Krista, sorry, as, as you said, screen. there's- Go ahead. Sorry, Chris, as you said, there's, it's, there's no simple family. They can be uh, very messy, but uh, adopted families, uh, step parents, is, is there one view for all of those if, if it builds out? So, on, on... Yep, it's a great question. As a matter of fact, let me actually just pull up a test tree that I play around with because I've got a quick and easy way to get to a couple of things there. So anytime that you um, have multiple sets of parents, you can add those um, in from the person page. So you always wanna do that from here. There's this edit relationship screen and that's where you can come in here and add multiple sets of parents. And once you do that, you're actually going to then see those multiple parents right here on this page. So in this case, I've got this individual who has a biological father, he has a biological mother, and then he has the father that raised him who actually never adopted him. Um, they, he actually was raised believing that was his father. And so uh, we've selected foster father from the relationship screen as a way to denote that relationship. And you can do that for any relationship in your tree. The default for parents and children is always biological, but you can come in here and adjust it to account for all of the glorious messiness that are families. Um, and for spouses as well, not everybody who, uh, who parent or uh, has children together, not everybody is married. Some people never have children together, never marry, and yet are significant relationships that you want to account for. And so you, the default when you add a spouse is spouse, but you can come in and change that 
option as well. So we do try to account for the messiness of families. <laughs> Uh, Any other questions qu that have come up? Yeah, uh, for a prefix to names such as Lord or Doctor, are, yeah. uh, is there an opportunity for those as well, for someone who has royalty in their family? Perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I always say. Um, when we're entering names in our family tree, what we're entering is their um, the information that they were born under. And other than a very few um, situations of royals, um, nobody is born a reverend or a doctor. <laughs> right? That is a title that they acquire at some point in their life. And so what I encourage you to do is add the title, but then add the date they acquired that title. If it's something they got by degree or by a bestowal of some sort, um, you can add that. And even with the royals, um, they, you know, may be born one thing. We've just seen this happen in England. And then those titles change over time. Uh, sometimes some of them having three and four and five titles throughout their life. And so attaching that title to a date puts it into this timeline that is created as you add facts and information about their life uh, rather than attaching it as an official part of their name. Terrific. What else you got for me? <laughs> well, a question about when someone comes across records and they're all handwritten, is there a way to help decipher what writing used to look like compared to how we read it now? Yeah, that is a great question. So let me just pull up, because I'm sitting here on this particular image, um, uh, and this is a record, of course, from the U.S., but it's from the 1900s, from 1900, and sometimes when you look at these records, as you can see, it can be a little bit difficult to decipher. So one of the things that Ancestry has done is, there we go, I had to get down here to the highlighted record. One of the things that we have done is we have gone through and actually indexed these records. We have um, either with a human person reading every record and typing it in, or with a computer, um, we've actually developed some handwriting recognition algorithms that are doing beautiful work on records now, um, so that we've created a searchable index of these records. And so now what we're doing is anytime that we've got an indexed record, we are adding these little pop-ups. So if you move your mouse over that name on that image, it actually tells you how we read it or what we think that that is. Same thing with this date field, his birth month is January, his birth year is 1858, he is 42 years old, he is widowed, that's the marital status field, his race is white, his gender is male. Now, um, those field labels are not ancestry field labels. Um, as we know, for things like race and gender, sometimes um, the meanings of those words have changed over time. And so we're always showing what it is on the record at the time the record was created. As a matter of fact, um, in this case, on this particular record, those are the um, field labels at the very top of the image in the field label columns. And so we also um, you know, give you some interpretation of what those are in the record themselves. So that's one of the ways that Ancestry yeah. helps you read the records themselves. I wish my grade seven English teacher had that technology and right. have dis deciphered my writing back then. Right, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, okay, qu any other questions we need to cover before we move on? Uh, a lot of uh, international questions about okay. records in India, Morocco, Let's talk uh, about Middle that. East. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the records on Ancestry. So building your family tree is the place to start. Um, it's the way that you can start having a place to collect that information. And again, building a family tree on Ancestry is free. You do not have to have a subscription for that. What a subscription on Ancestry pays for is access to these historical records that Ancestry is gathering and digitizing and indexing and making searchable. We currently have more than 30 billion records on the site from 80 countries around the world. And we add an average of about 3 million new records every day to the website. So it's this constantly growing collection of historical records. Now, there are three primary ways to access those records once you decide uh, to have a subscription. As you build your tree, you'll see these little leaves pop up. That little leaf on a tree, on a person in your tree, means Ancestry has matched information in your tree to information in a record. And so you can click it, 
um, and view and see what the record is. If you have a subscription, you can actually then click through and view the actual record itself. So those, um, those hints, keep in mind they are just hints, right? It's a computer comparing a name, a date, and a place to a name and a date and a place in a record. Now you may think that your grandfather has the most unique name in the whole world. I have a great, great grandfather named Julius Carl Nowak. He was from Prussia. He was born in the 1840s, but Nowak, it turns out, is like the fourth most popular name in Prussia at the time, <laughs> right, surname. And so even though it's a super unique name to me and it's a unique name where he ended up in Southern Texas, it's not a unique name in the place where he was from. So a computer is going to match names and dates and places and show you possible records. You need to review that with something of a critical eye to make sure, is this really my person? And when you click on that hint, we allow you the option to um, decide if it is your person or if it is not your person. Um, and if you don't know, we also give you a maybe option so that you can save it for later and not lose that particular record. As a matter of fact, anytime you click yes, no, or maybe on a hint, we also give you a little space to type in some thoughts so that you can kind of keep track of your reasoning so that when you come back to it, um, you can pick right up where you left off. That's one of the things about family history, if you get into it, that you'll discover. Sometimes I just have 10 or 15 minutes. And so I'll grab my phone and I'll look at some hints and I'll do some things. Sometimes I have an hour and you know I'll sit down at lunch and I'll work on my family tree during my lunch break. Sometimes, actually every single Sunday night for the <laughs> last five years, I sit down, I call my dad on FaceTime and have him on a little stand next to my two computer monitors. And we dig in for four hours every Sunday night. In, in six years now, almost, we've only missed, I think, four Sundays. So, so everybody has different amounts of time that they can give to this at different times and seasons in their life. And so we try to provide you with some tools like making notes for yourself when you're reviewing hints so that when you do have time to sit back down, you don't have to think, now what in the world was I doing three weeks ago when I was looking at this person in my family tree? So we do try to try to provide you with that information. And Krista, that's, that's why we yeah. think this is such a great relationship between CARP and Ancestry because of that opportunity of time and interest. Yeah. And as you say, the season of their life where they may have thought about this for a long time and now have the opportunity, the inclination and the, the wherewithal to get to get in there and dig. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking of records, a couple of specifics people are asking about uh, church records, uh, Holocaust records, Ellis Island. And unfortunately, Heather and Eric are asking about records that may have been destroyed in a fire of a church. So okay. maybe a little bit about all of those, please. Yep. Let me get through. Let me finish getting yep. through these three ways to find hints, and then we will take a look absolutely at exactly some of those questions. Okay. I appreciate that people are asking them, and their their brains are going in the exact right direction. You're just a, about a half a step ahead of me. So let's um, let's just finish running through this really quickly. So reviewing okay. hints, Ancestry is going to deliver some records directly to you in your tree. Then the second thing, the second way to access records on Ancestry is by searching. So hints, Ancestry is just matching up what it can based on information you have in your tree. Searching is actually you taking everything you know about this person, diving into those 30 billion records and seeing what bubbles up to the top of the list there. Okay, so that's two ways into the records. Oh, we're not gonna do that yet. Um, so let me just sh answer the questions that are being asked. The third way to access records, and this is actually my favorite way. <laughs> um, as a researcher, this is kind of a hardcore researcher, kind of a geeky thing. Um, I am sure many of you remember card catalogs, right? You go into the library, the library is full of books, and you go to the actual card catalog. It was drawers and there were cards, right? Um, and the card would tell you where to find the book. Ancestry has a card catalog. On the ancestry.ca site, we've even spelled it correctly for you. It's spelled differently in American English. So on .com. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, when you go to the card catalog, this is a listing of all of the databases on Ancestry. Now, when you go on Ancestry.ca, when you go to the card catalog, you'll notice here, let me make my screen a little smidge bigger. There we go. 
that we are only showing you 1940 databases. And that's because we are only showing you the Canadian records to start with. But if you uncheck that, you'll see now all 33,204 databases on Ancestry. So let's go back to our library analogy. You walk into the library, you don't go to the card catalog to read the story in Shakespeare's Tempest. You go to the card catalog to figure out where I need to go in the library to find that book so that I can read that book. That's the same thing here. You come into the card catalog not to find your grandfather, but to find what records might he be in and where do I go then to search for him in those specific records. So all the questions everybody's asking about what records does Ancestry have for X country, this is the place where you get that answer. So card catalog 101 for Ancestry.ca is this. Uncheck display Canadian records only and then type in the name of the country. It's that simple. And we will show you which databases of records we have for that particular place. So I can type in Italy, I can type in England, I can type in Poland. Somebody's gonna ask this question, I'm gonna jump it, ready? Somebody's gonna say, well, if my family lived in a place where the boundaries changed, right? My great -grand grandfather's from Prussia, he, Prussia no longer exists. And the place where he lived has bounced back and forth over time between Poland and Germany. So do I search Prussia, Poland, or Germany? And the answer is yes. <laughs> all, of, all of the above. Yeah, like you wanna see because when the records were created, they might be called one thing. Um, and when the records are published, in this case, we've tried to add, um, Ancestry has tried to add all of the names that are applicable in the record collection. But sometimes depending on where those records ended up, they may only have the name of one of those places. So sometimes you have to do a few different searches. So, so card catalog 101, search by place first. And you can, again, you can do this without a subscription. To actually click through and search and view the records, you'll need a subscription, but you don't need a subscription just to search and see what's even available on the website. That's gonna, I encourage you to do that. That's gonna help you become familiar with whether or not Ancestry even has the records that you're looking for. So step one, search by place. The connection between, you know, white European North American societies and uh, Eastern South Asian societies is a relatively new phenomenon in, in that we're fortunate to have now. Tell, tell me a bit about India, China, Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's a great question. So Ancestry actually had an office in Beijing for five years. We were scanning uh, family books, they're called Jiaopu, in the Shanghai library for five years. And we have been trying to figure out how to index those records for several years to make them searchable. So we do have digital collections that are in the works for places like China. In the case of India, one of the challenges is that the historical records are held usually by village and usually by an elder in the family. So they're loosely family or community based birth, marriage, and death records written into these beautiful books, but stored sometimes in somebody's house, and then that person passes it on to somebody else. So to go out and acquire records, um, the effort is massive. And so one of the things that Ancestry has undertaken is um, we're out trying to encourage archives in countries to gather and preserve records, and then we can go into the archive and help them digitize those records. And so we're playing a long game. Ancestry is in this for the long haul. We've been, like I said, we've been around since the 1980s as a genealogical company. We've been online since 1996. We have poured over the last two decades, um, about $20 million into, that's US dollars, <laughs> into um, digitizing and preserving records, historical records around the world and helping archives to do that. Um, we're actually, um, we actually just with a couple of other organizations managed to work with an organization in Poland to take some of our camera equipment and our 
um, laptop and, and digitization equipment and get it to this archive in Poland, who then was able to get it into Ukraine to help digitize some of the records in some of these facilities that are being destroyed because of the current invasion. So, so pres preservation of historical records is something that is so important to us because that is part of our identity is um, as a company, as an organization, as genealogists who work here. Um, and so we're constantly trying to look for ways to get records online from wherever we can. Um, but we do have also budget constraints because we are a business. And so we have plans for how we move into other areas of the world. And there are two ways we decide where we go get records from. One of those is who's building trees on our sites and what are the birth, marriage and death locations in their trees. And the other one is who's taking ancestry DNA tests and where in the world is their DNA from. And as more people build trees on our site and more people take the DNA test, those priorities start to shift based on who needs what records from us. So I definitely want to hear more about those DNA tests. And I know that's coming up in our agenda. Yeah. And just a question from Charlotte. How far back can we actually expect to go? Uh, Charlotte says she's got some information almost 250 years. Uh, can she expect to go further? How, how far? How far do we have records? That's a really great question. So um, one of the things um, that determines the answer to that question is where in the world your family is from. I mentioned those family books in China. Some of those literally go back 2000 years. Um, and so they have kept family records for that long consistently unbroken. Um, the challenge is of course, they've only recorded the husbands and the fathers and the sons, no wives or daughters. Um, and so it's a male-based record. Um, for some countries like um, England, for example, uh, the churches started keeping baptisms and marriages and burial records in the parishes in the mid 1500s. So once you get back to about 1550, 1560, there are no more records. Um, but there are other places in the world where records come to a screeching halt in you know, the early 1800s. It just kind of depends. Um, there are some cultures uh, still in, in, for example, uh, Kenya, Africa, um, they are an oral based culture. So they don't keep, they have never kept written records except during certain periods of colonization where the colonizers have kept some records. Um, everything is transmitted orally. The family history sometimes for 10 and 12 generations. And that is a, a important part of their culture but nothing is written down. And so family search is actually currently um, as part of their historical record preservation process, sending people around some of those countries doing interviews of the person in the village that's responsible for that oral history so that it becomes audio records that we can then transcribe and build into family trees. That, that was another question about indigenous records. And, and there was a couple of questions about that. So there may be some written records, but and those would be oftentimes church records and, and similar things. Correct. But there, there are oral tradition, oral records that are being gathered now. Yes, absolutely. Magical. Great. Yeah, it is fantastic. Okay, any other questions before we talk about DNA for a few minutes? Oh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, we are going to have um, another session, and I'm sure you'll announce more about that, but um, where we get to talk about how we can actually use DNA um, in the process of family tree building. But I do just wanna kind of give like a DNA primer. Um, if you haven't taken a DNA test, this is an invitation to do that so that when we do meet together next time, you may have your results back and it means a little bit something more to you. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about that. As a matter of fact, I need to pop it up here. Here we go. Okay, so, um, sorry for the little transition here. I use a different program than PowerPoint and sometimes it's, it's internet based. So when I'm on Zoom, it's a smidge slower than I like it to be. There we go. Okay. So some just basic basics about uh, DNA. Currently Ancestry is the largest DNA, consumer DNA network in the world. And the reason largest is important in this context is because when you take an Ancestry DNA test, part of the process is that we match you with anybody else who's taken the ancestry DNA test that shares enough DNA with you that we think you have a recent common ancestor in your family tree. 
And so this gives you the most opportunity for uh, finding some of those connections. Um, when you pair that then with the trees and the records, it means you're not just getting matched with a cousin. It means if somebody is my third cousin, we have a common set of great grandparents, great, great grandparents, and maybe we can figure out together who those people are. So just some basics about genetic inheritance and DNA. Each of us have 22 or 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 what we call autosomes, and then chromosome number 23 is your sex chromosome. Men and women both have DNA. That's one of the questions I get asked all the time is, can women take a DNA test? Yes, women have 23 pairs of chromosomes, just like everybody else. In each pair, one of those we got from our dad and one of those we got from our mom. So everybody has 50% of their dad's DNA and 50% of their mom's DNA. However, you don't get an even 50-50 split of your dad's DNA. You get a random 50% of his DNA. So here's a fun little example that I had our creative <laughs> team put together for me because it helps it make sense for people. Um, I'm not, I was, until I got into DNA, I was not a math or science person at all. It was like this huge mental block for me. And I used to make up this story about how I was terrible at math and science. And my best friend is a marine biologist. And when I started teaching DNA classes, the first time I taught a class, she came and she sat in the back and she laughed at me and then she helped me get it right. So, <laughs> so now I have taken all of that knowledge that I've absorbed over the course of the last 10 years and we've distilled it into this because I get that some people are a little bit intimidated by the science of it all. So I want you to imagine for just a minute that you have a grandfather named Andrew and a grandmother named Sandra. Andrew and Sandra um, then have a child and that child gets 50% of his DNA from his father and 50% of his DNA from his mother. And so in this case, his name is Edward, right? Hopefully you can see that, three letters from each parent. Now your other set of grandparents, uh, Graham and Elaine, they have a daughter named Angela. She also gets 50% of her DNA from her father, 50% from her mother. Her name becomes Angela. Then Edward and Angela, have a child. This child is you. Your name is Gerald. And what you can see here is that um, you've inherited 50% of your DNA from your father and 50% of your DNA from your mother. That DNA gets recombined. Um, but what you didn't get was half an E and half a D and half a W, and half, right? You got a random 50% of his DNA. You have two siblings. Your two siblings are not also named Gerald. And that's because they also got 50% of your parents' DNA, but they got a different 50%. And it's random. So you can see here, you all look like siblings. You all have a G, a couple of you have an R, all three of you have an A, a couple of you have an L, right? So you have things in common, we can tell your siblings, but the DNA you inherited from your parents is a random 50%. Make sense? And you, and you don't know what 50% you got. You don't. So question no from control over it. <laughs> yeah, question from Norm. Uh, I think you've answered it here. He has three sons, all uh -huh. from the same mother. Yep. If they did three different ancestry DNA tests, they would get likely three, three different, different responses. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, because they inherited three or a different random 50% of DNA from each parent. Now, the only exception to this, of course, is identical twins. Identical twins um, inherit the exact same pieces of DNA. Um, fraternal twins are just like any other two siblings, random 50%, but identical twins will have the same DNA. So that's kind of how that um, works. You end up with little pieces of DNA that make their way down over time. Um, but then you also have things that get lost over time. So for example, Andrew has this W here and Andrew passed that W on to Edward, but then Edward didn't pass that W on to any of his children. Um, and that's because you know, they only got 50%. Now there's a math, there's a math problem here. So for those of you who love math, this is going to make sense to you. For the rest of you, hang on. It might be a little mind blowing, but I think you'll get it. Okay. Um, if I have one child, I give 50% randomly of my DNA to that child. If I have a second child, I give 50% randomly of my DNA to that child. The overlap between the two of them is around 50%, which means that between the two of them, 
in total, they have 75% of my DNA. If I have a third child, it's gonna be half again. So now I'm gonna have about 87% of my DNA represented in my three children. If I have a fourth child, it's gonna be half again. So I'm gonna have about 93% if I'm doing my math in my head correctly on the fly, right? So by the time you hit about five children, um, the probability of 100%-ish of your DNA being passed on is pretty good. Um, so here's two things that that means. One of it is that if your parents are deceased, and you want to understand all of your parents' DNA and kind of reach further back in time to connect with cousins who connect you with ancestors, you want to test as many of your siblings as possible. And that's not just me trying to sell more DNA kits. <laughs> that's actually scientific and mathematical probabilities. Okay. It also means that um, if you don't have siblings to test, Think, go back another generation and think about your aunt and uncle. Your aunt and uncle inherited 50% of your grandparents' DNA, and then they passed on a random 50% to their children. So your first cousins, you and your first cousin are going to share about 12.5% of your grandparents' DNA. So anytime you can start to test family members, it's going to help you connect further back in the family tree. So that's kind of, kind of how that works. So here is uh, the process. If you just go to ancestry.ca, when you buy a test, um, we send you everything you need in a kit. Um, the kit includes a spit tube. It is a saliva-based test. Um, it's super gross to talk about, but basically it's about a quarter of a teaspoon of saliva. You spit in it. You can't eat or drink or smoke for 30 minutes before. Um, you screw the cap on. It's got a preservation solution in it. You put that into the return mailer. You send that back to us. There's can't be any harder than the COVID tests we've all been taking. Recently. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. I would do a DNA test over that any day. Um, in each box is an activation kit um, or card. If you already have an Ancestry subscription, you just log into your Ancestry subscription and then follow the instructions. Um, if you don't have an Ancestry account, the process of activating your DNA test will create a, one of those free registered guest accounts for you. And then you can just start building your tree on that. And then you just wait. It takes about six to eight weeks for the whole process to happen. And then those results, you'll get an email. They're returned to you on Ancestry. So you log in and you'll get your um, DNA results. You want to make sure that if you've started building a tree that you attach your DNA results to your tree uh, because what that allows us then to do is as we deliver all of these cousin matches and information to you through your DNA results, we can also start to look at your tree and your cousin's family trees and we can say, oh, this person is your second cousin because you have this grandfather in common. So the DNA says your second cousins, the tree tells us how. Um, and if you've started a tree, we can use not just your tree, but the hundred million other trees on Ancestry that might have some of that information in it to help you make some of those connections. The other thing I would encourage you to do uh, if you take a DNA test or if you start a family tree uh, is to go into your Ancestry account. Uh, your, you have the option to create a profile. So there's like a default profile that's created for you that just has like a icon. You can upload a photo of any kind. I would encourage you to do that. It's actually been proven through some of our statistics that people who upload a photo um, are like 10 times more likely to be contacted by a possible cousin. Uh, same, it's kind of like if you think about social media, right? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you might be on social media. If you have a photo, people are more likely to interact with you. If you just have the default icon, they think you're a bot account or that you're new or that you don't know what you're doing. Um, so even if you don't know what you're doing on Ancestry, add a photo um, and you'll find that a lot of people will connect with you more fully. So let me just show you my, um, my results. I'm happy to share those so that people kind of get an idea of what will be returned. And then, like I said, next time we'll get to kind of dig into these um, in a little bit more in our next webinar uh, about how to use these results to make discoveries. So when you take an Ancestry DNA test, it's going to have to load the page here for a minute we return several results. The first thing that we return is what's called your DNA story. 
We compare your DNA to uh, a reference panel of people from regions all around the world. Clearly, I have never logged on to this on the .ca website, so it's giving me all the little prompts. <laughs> um, and let me make my screen normal-sized again. There we go. Uh, we compare your DNA to people from all over the world, and we return what's called an ethnicity estimate. So this ethnicity estimate, you'll see um, it is percentage-based. So 31% of my DNA matches a reference panel of a uh, population of people with deep roots in Scotland and 21% with uh, England and Northwestern Europe and 16% with Ireland. So we give you that estimate then, um, and we update those. So that reference panel continues to grow. Um, the science continues to get a little bit smarter about it. So I'm not gonna suddenly become Chinese or Brazilian, right, uh, when the update happens, but those percentages might shift. I might become a little more Irish or a little um, little more Swedish or a little less, you know, English, whatever, um, as those reference populations grow. Again, for those of you who understand kind of statistics and um, how that modeling works, that it makes sense. But we do that update about once a year. We usually run that in the summer. Um, when you're running it against 22 million samples, it takes a while. And then we publish those usually in the fall. So the last, the latest update just occurred a few weeks ago. And then um, we also have this brand new feature where because we have such a large, large database and because we have this DNA matching feature, we can tell which chromosome, like we can tell kind of chromosome one and chromosome two, which pair uh, goes together. And so we can split it parent one and parent two. So we can start to show you which ethnicities you inherited from parent one and which ethnicities you inherited from parent two. And then <laughs> um, because Ancestry has a hundred million family trees on the site, we also can start connecting you with more recent communities. So your ethnicity estimate is looking at where in the world your DNA was 500 to a thousand years ago. And for the vast majority of us, our family trees are not built back that far. We don't know that much about all of our ancestors who lived 500 years ago. But the genetic communities, because of our matching program, start to connect you with where in the world your ancestors lived within the last 200 years. And so in my case, I only have one community. My dad has, um, I think, two. My grandmother has four, including a community in England. So she just didn't pass the bits of DNA that connect to that community in England down to me. So I don't have that community, but I do have this community of my mother's um, that she has. Uh, neither of her parents were tested. They're both deceased before DNA testing, but it allows us to kind of see back about hundred to 200 years. So that is um, your DNA story. And then the final part of the DNA um, connection is those matches that we talked about. And we will dive into those in our next session. So before we wrap up, do we have any last minute questions? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a few. And one about DNA uh, related to the safety of that data. Who is it mm -hmm. shared with? How is it stored? And I think my, my question would be about uh, genetic information related to health and, yeah. and those concerns. So tell me a little bit about Yeah, that. really briefly. So uh, when you activate your DNA test, it is with a code. So you activate it on the Ancestry website with your name and your birth year and that code. And we store that separate from everything else on Ancestry and in secure servers. Then when you mail the kit in, all the kit has on it is the code and it is sent to the DNA lab that does the processing and they don't know anything about you. All they have is that code on that test, um, on that test tube. They then process the kit, um, process the saliva sample, create the data file, and they return that data file securely to us. And then we match it up in our, in our closed system with that activation information. So the lab that processes the result has no clue who you are and never does. Um, we then um, match that information in our system. And like I said, it's stored in a separate system here from all the other data at Ancestry and then is processed into um, your results. At any time, you can ask us to completely destroy your sample. We do save those samples in case you want to upgrade to some of our other features. We do not do health testing uh, here at Ancestry. So there's no health 
or medical information attached, but we do have a program called Traits where we can tell you things like if you have a propensity for baldness or are you a night owl or do you, um, does cilantro taste like soap to you? I, like, <laughs> so fun things like that. We can destroy the sample. We can also delete the data at any time at your request. Um, but we do maintain those so that we can continue to provide the services to you that, that you took the test for. Terrific. Ed, I do see we're getting really close to the end. There's, there's some questions related to specific usage, but I, I will ask you to, to share your website where people can go in the interim to find out a lot. I've seen dozens, if not hundreds more videos at Krista that you have there. And, and just to talk a, a little bit about the pricing, and I know that CARP is offering our members a 40% discount on a number of the plans. And if I pull up my own internet here, I can. Yeah, so if you just go to ancestry.ca slash subscribe, that's where you're gonna see our current pricing information. Like you mentioned, there is um, a partnership uh, deal available through CARP. And I believe that information will be sent out yeah. to web attendees if it hasn't already been. Yeah. Um, we were offering 40% off the Canada, Canada Discovery Plus Fantastic. and the World Explorer pricing. So Fantastic. that's it. The World Explorer is everything on Ancestry, uh, not minus DNA. And the Canada Discovery Plus is all Canadian and key global records. Correct. There you go. Fantastic. And then if anybody wants to follow along with me, uh, you can find me on Facebook if you're on Facebook or on Instagram. Um, and I do share out um, any links anytime I post a video on YouTube or um, a training video on Facebook or any of that. I share those through those channels. Yeah, I, I saw great, great starter information, great information for those who have dug in a lot deeper, Krista. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I know that people can go to Ancestry.ca. They can sign up for that, that free uh, free subscription so that they can start their own family tree and start entering information. There are often uh, free trials where they can try for a limited period of time without having to, to pay any anything out of their pocket. And then there are ongoing monthly fees for which they can receive the discount with CARP. So uh, lots of ways to get started. We encourage everyone to, to do that. Uh, get started now. Uh, get engaged and come back. Uh, I think we're back in a month. We'll send out the information shortly to our members and we look forward to seeing you again, Krista. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us. We had a couple of hundred on the line today. I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to learning more and thank you everyone for your time and listening in and for your questions. Uh, looking forward to doing it again. Take care everyone.